Hello, I'm Chu Wee-Lin and welcome to today's session of In Parliament. The National Development Minister's ministerial statement on town councils was the highlight of today's session. This after the recent review into the sale of town council management software to Action Information Management or AIM. The debate was allowed to carry on long after the time allotted for the day. Well, I'll have more of that a little later. But first, during question time, Parliament was told that to date, 11 travellers in Singapore have been investigated for H7 N9 and 24 for the novel coronavirus and none of them were positive. However, Health Minister Gan Kim Yong says there is a need to remain vigilant against the possibility of cases in travellers coming to Singapore. The ministry has alerted all hospitals and doctors to look out for suspect cases with symptoms such as fever, cough and signs of pneumonia and a travel history to affected areas. Mr Gan said the risk of an outbreak here remains low so long as there is no sustained human-to-human -human transmission of the diseases. He said the ministry is monitoring the situation closely and there is no indication so far that more drastic measures are required. A lot of the residents are concerned about this mainly is because uh, they, they think that they may not be sufficient hospital bed should the need arise because of their, uh, their experience currently. The hospitals are ready. One of the possible measures, for example, is to um, uh, defer some of the elective uh, surgery so that uh, we can free up beds for uh, emergency cases that would come in. Uh, another possible measure that we are also looking at is to uh, enhance, to facilitate discharge for the uh, medically stable patients, either to step down care or uh, uh, help them to be discharged to home. And we can provide home support for these patients so that additional beds could be freed up uh, when necessary. Communications and Information Minister Dr. Jacob Ibrahim says his ministry will do its due diligence to determine whether the review on party political film restrictions are in line with societal changes. He was responding to a question from MP Zaki Mohammed, who said the political landscape had changed since amendments were last made in 2009 and asked whether feedback would be sought in this area. Dr. Jacob had earlier announced that his ministry is reviewing the Films Act and intends to introduce amendments to the Act. The review includes existing political party films. The government has accepted the recommendation and amended the Films Act in 2009 to allow political films that do not depict events, persons or situations in a dramatic way. This was done to allow greater space for political discourse while ensuring that political debate in Singapore remains serious and robust. Both objectives remain relevant. However, we recognize that it is useful to periodically review and assess if existing rules governing PPFs continue to be the best way to achieve these objectives as our society changes and our polity matures. Sengkang and Punggol will each have 14 new childcare centres within the next two years. And by 2018, Sengkang will have an additional nine centres, while Punggol another 12. Acting Minister Chan Chun Singh said the Early Childhood Development Agency is working with HDB to pre-build childcare facilities alongside upcoming BTO projects. The agency is also open to alternative locations such as workplaces, disused facilities and integrated developments. How is demand uh, determined? I'm asking this because even for mature estates, there are also BTO projects coming up and anticipated would be young families moving in as well. And so I would think that there will be an increase in demand for childcare, student care and even infant care. So how we determine demand is based on the cohort size in the respective estates. We also take in feedback from the respective uh, grassroots leaders if they see a uh, demand for such things. We also look at the queue at the existing childcare places in the vicinity so that we have a sense of uh, what's the demand. For example, we also understand that in uh, Sengkang and Pongo, uh, generally the younger families there have less uh, grandparent support, so they <coughs> will need a bit, of, uh, a bit more childcare places and that we have catered for it accordingly. The penalty for high-rise littering is likely to be significantly raised. That's what Environment Minister Vivian Balakrishnan told the House. He said he's not satisfied with the situation currently, referring to the low number of culprits caught against a large number of complaints annually. The most recent cases, he added, were only fined between $800 to $1,500. Since closed-circuit television cameras were installed in hotspots in 2011, Dr Balakrishnan said 12 suspects have been caught and five 
prosecuted. However, the number of complaints received a year stands at 8,000. He said CCTVs are used only as a last resort after MPs and local grassroots and authorities fail to nail the culprit. Several MPs had a number of suggestions to tackle the issue, but Dr. Balakrishnan maintained that installing more CCTVs cannot be the only solution. This cat and mouse game cannot be the real solution. And we need more effective assumption of personal responsibility and we need local action on the ground by people who are actually living there and actually know who the culprits are. Having said that, there's also a very small minority who frankly really have mental problems and even their family members are aware of it and sometimes reach the end of the limit. And in those cases, what they really need is psychiatric help and treatment. And it's not a matter of penalties and, you know, and, and photographing them on camera. Well, after question time, National Development Minister Kuo Boon Wan delivered his ministerial statement on town councils. This comes after a review looking into the sale of town council management software to Action Information Management, or AIM, a PAP-owned company. Questions had been raised about a possible conflict of interest in AIM contracting with town councils run by PAP MPs. Now, while the review concluded that the AIM transaction in 2010 has complied with the Town Councils Act and financial rules, Mr. Kaur announced a subsequent review on town councils in Singapore. It will be headed by Senior Minister of State for National Development, Li Yixian. Mr. Kaur said the review will examine at least three areas. Firstly, the town council's duties and responsibilities. Mr. Mr. Kaur said the current legislation where an elected MP runs a town council has been largely successful, but some have suggested going back to the government administering estates all over Singapore. He said an accommodative solution will need to be reached. The legislation to empower the elected MP to run the town council so that he can respond more promptly to his residents' needs and work with his voters to shape their town's identity has generally been a success. The need to create a nexus between an elected MP and his voters through his work in the town council, which has a direct bearing on the daily life of the residents, is a strategic imperative which cannot be faulted. We should not return to status quo ante where HDB administers estates all over Singapore and MPs have no authority or responsibility over what is done or how well things work. I'm hopeful that two decades of actual experience in running town councils will enable us to evolve a good practical approach. The second area to be reviewed is the adequacy of town council's sinking funds and its long-term financial sustainability. Town councils are required under the Town Councils Act to build up sinking funds for big-ticket items like lifts, mechanical and electrical equipment and major repairs. But Mr. Kaur said most find it difficult to explain to residents why their service and conservancy charges have to go up to build the funds further when there are already millions of dollars in it. He noted that some have resorted to delaying in increases which are necessary, creating a serious problem eventually when replacement and maintenance works are due. Mr. Kaur also cited other examples to illustrate how political pressures on town councils can lead them to making suboptimal decisions, resulting in poorer outcomes for residents. MND has also observed that town councils do not want to take on more responsibilities, especially if these carry a political cost. There are currently two cleaning teams. One engaged the contract, one contractor and appointed by the Hawkers Association. They clean the tabletops. Another team by the town council, town councils, clean the floor and also the toilets. I mean, we, we know, you know, we laugh about it. This division is clearly inefficient, but to consolidate the cleaning function into one, will require the town councils to have to charge the storeholders a higher SNCC. And most are reluctant to do so. 
Mr. Kaur said the handover and transition arrangements when MPs change will also need to be examined. He said the report had pointed out that the current Town Council's Act does not have adequate provisions for such transitions. After the Pongo East by-election, Pasiris Pongo Town Council had to hand over the management of Pongo East SMC to Algini Aukam Pongo East Town Council. Both town councils agreed to an official handover on April the 30th, 2013, but they needed to share the office space from May the 1st, as <coughs> Pasiris Pongo Town Council needed more time to prepare its alternative office before it could move out. How to share office space from May 1st became a point of discussions. There was initial frustrations when both parties could not agree to the proposed layout for the shared office. Differences also arose over several other issues. <coughs> MND officers step in to facilitate the handover and broker an arrangement acceptable to both parties. And eventually both sides came to a compromise on the various issues. Opposition MPs, especially the Workers' Party, Sylvia Lim, say the sale of the Town Council Management System, or TCMS, is not for the good of the Town Council. We believe that the sale of the TCMS by the PAPTCs, whatever its other ancillary benefits, was to enable AIM to cut off any non-PAPTC from using the TCMS at short notice, crippling the TC. I cannot help but recall the parliamentary debate in 1988 when the Town Council Bill was first presented for the second reading. At that debate, the then First Deputy Prime Minister, Go Chok Tong, justified the introduction of Town Councils as providing political stabilisers to the political system. He said there was a need to protect the public by ensuring that political parties which aspire to be government should first prove that they could run a town council for a constituency. Workers' Party MP Pritam Singh said the lessons from the AIM affair is the depoliticizing of the relationship between the government and town councils. He said this is significant because it raises not just the issue of a review of the Town Councils Act, but the substantive relationship of the government towards wards which are not run by PAP town councils. For the specific purposes of this debate, depoliticization must mean that companies owned by political parties should not tender for town council contracts, a glaring omission from the MND report. In addition to the recommendations called for by the Member of Parliament for Aljunia GRC, Ms. Sylvia Lim, the reports call for depoliticization, if executed as imagined by most Singaporeans, would effectively entail inducting a new brand of politics into Singapore in so far as government town council relations is concerned representing a hope and desire that goes far and beyond the findings of the MND report, but one that is in line with public expectation. PAP MP for Potong Pasir, Sito Ipin, related his own experience when his team took over the Potong Pasir Town Council following his win in the 2011 general election. Mr Sito described the handover as emotionally tiring, but added he did what he felt he had to do. From my experience in taking over the Potong Pasir Town Council, I learned a few important lessons which I would like to share with the House today. One, change is tough and sometimes painful, but sometimes change is necessary. Two, handover immediately after the elections is not an easy objective to achieve. When a handover happens between two political parties with different cultures and systems. Three, the Town Council is an instrument first and foremost designed to serve residents. Four, the Town Council is also an organisation with a political dimension. The two are not in conflict. Nominated MP Assistant Professor Eugene Tan said he is in favour of town councils, even as there is a need to improve its governance framework. He said as a local form of government, town councils have transformed the role of the elected MP from being a politician to someone who is directly accountable to their voters for the day-to-day -day upkeep of HDB estates. And while he felt the ministry should maintain a light-touch regulatory approach in town council matters, it should also take a more prominent role in overseeing any changes. Over. For instance, MND should administer the handover process 
and or be the arbiter in the event of any dispute or disagreement. New subsidiary legislation may need to be drafted to prescribe the protocols in detail on the handing and taking over. This relates to political parties as well as MND. This can reduce political opportunism and ensure that accountability and transparency are given due attention even during transitions. MP for Mo Main Kalang GRC, Denise Poir, rebutted Ms Sylvia Lim's claims that there was intention to cripple any new town council leadership of a different political affiliation. She said the first thing on the minds of PAP town council chairpersons was to find a cost-effective way to redevelop the next town council management system software. Factors such as cash flow, affordability and perhaps ripping economies of scale were some of our top of mind considerations. To be honest, the last thing on the minds of my fellow TC chairpersons, our TC councillors and the staff, the last thing was to fix or to trip the opposition. Accusing us of plotting to sell the TCMS software in 2009, prior to the 2011 general election, is nothing but a figment of imagination of some parties. GE 2011 then was the last thing on our mind. Some of us don't even know we'll be fielded. We're more concerned with the mechanics of the old and the new software. Our conscience was and is clear. Wrapping up the debate, Mr. Corbun Wan said the National Development Ministry had applied the Town Council Act and financial rules consistently to all town councils. He said town councils were given the latitude to waive the need to call for a tender from vendors. And Ms. Sylvia Lim had exercised this when our Junit Hogang Town Council appointed FM Solutions and Services, or FMSS in short, as its management agent in 2011. Mr. Kaur told the House that FMSS was set up by a group of Hogang Town Council employees, a husband and wife team who have a long association with the Workers' Party. How would the work Ms. Silverlium characterize the FMSS transactions? In substance, has public interest been protected? Would she take the position that contracts like these given to close party associates be prohibited? In the AIL contract public interest, was enhanced. Can the same be said for the FMSS contract? Mr. Kaur said Ms. Lim had chosen to paint the AIM transaction in a sinister light. And to suggest that the PAP has used the AIM transaction to trip up the incoming MPs. It's like what the Chinese say is, you know, Pei Kong Se Ying, seeing a snake in a cup when actually it is nothing more than a reflection of a bow hung on the wall. In any case, are we so stupid? Are we so stupid? As the Workers' Party themselves pointed out, the people who will suffer are the residents. Why would we want to deliberately disrupt the lives of residents in Elgenit? Would the WP just keep quiet and not make a political issue out of it? Who then would get the blame? Why would the PAP want to hurt the interests of residents in Elgenit and alienate them? How could we hope to regain Elgenit if we did this? Mr. Kaur said Ms. Lim could have asked for an extension of AIM services to prevent disruption of essential services. He pointed to Mr. Sito E. Pin, who had dealt with a similar transition when he took over as MP for Potong Pasir. He didn't feel anything wrong to ask for an extension of the service of the general manager who had served for many years under Mr. Cham Sitong. He placed residents' interests first and because he ventured to ask, he ensured a successful transition and handing over at Potong Pasir. The transition there was not without problems. There were many. But instead of bad-mouthing or finding excuses through attributing problems to his predecessor, he and his team worked quietly round the clock to minimize any disruptions to their residents. That is the professional way of dealing with handing over.
MP for Aljunit GRC, Pritam Singh, and National Development Minister Korbun Wan also differed on whether the town council should be politicized. Mr. Pritam said FMSS, which is currently engaged by the Workers' Party to run the Aljunit Hogang Town Council, is not owned by the party. Mr. Kaur disagreed. He also disagreed with the suggestion to disallow political parties from having business dealings with town councils. So far as the strategic review of TCs are concerned, uh, MND should really look at directing companies fully owned by political parties, not having any business dealing with town councils. Now, I understand the minister extended that to say party supporters also, but that would make it really hazy because everybody goes to the polls. Somebody votes for PEP, somebody votes for WP. Nobody will be, will be able to bid for a TC contract under that definition. Mr. Pritam Singh, of course, wants to define party affiliation narrowly, which I disagree. You know, town councils is, is, is a we are the policy owner, you know, and we have good reasons to define party affiliations, why they cannot be so narrow as just party owned. And FNSS shareholders are not ordinary Singaporeans. When, when Pritam Singh said, now by widening this definition, it covers the whole of Singapore, it doesn't. They are strong, clearly long-term supporters of the Workers' Party. MP for Aljunit GRC, Sylvia Lim, also sought clarification on the one-month termination clause. The Minister did not answer my clarification on his personal view of whether a one-month termination clause for a critical IT system is reasonable and does not jeopardise continuity of services to residents. So, I reply very indirectly in the way I handle the NUH project that if you want, there are standard software available in the market. So if indeed there's one month, there are, there are available software which you can buy into. But in this case, the key point is not that. The key point is AIM was most willing to extend if only you asked, you didn't. Does he not agree that the uh, town council management software is actually customised? And, and I, I don't know whether he's, what other software he's suggesting can be bought off the market. Madam Speaker, I, I didn't want to say this, but trying to make mountain out of a molehill, you know, of all of this, this big name, what is it, Town Council mentioned, Town TCMS, you know, when you dive into it, what is it? These are financial packages, because every organisation has to charge fees, have to collect revenue, and there will be bad debts to deal with, account receiver, account, account payable. All organizations have that kind of requirements and there are standard softwares available. Parliament has adjourned to a date to be fixed. Good night.